Here we go. Let's see. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Um, we're just gonna let the room fill up first and we should be all set to go. All right. Yeah. Show of hands, who's been, who's watched the show, the first episode? I got, I watched majority of the first episode. <laughs> We're going to try and not do spoilers. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know though. If you really care, you've already watched it. <laughs> well, yeah. It's, it's only been a week. Cool. I'm going to let people, I'm not going to spoil yeah. it. I don't know. In the first episode, not that many spoilers, you know? I don't know. Maybe something crazy happens at the end of the episode. <laughs> But yeah, we're, we're not going to do any spoilers. Um, I'm going to give my uh, contrarian opinion on it. <laughs> Other people will talk about how much they love it. And then um, we'll just draw. So you don't have to worry about it too much. And no, we're not going to do any spoilers. You really I don't think by nature of it being a prequel that it's already been spoiled. Well, it's set 172 years before, so actually there's a lot of information that we don't know. Um, so is she, is, is, what's your name in it? Uh, mm -mm. Can't tell you. Uh, can't tell you. Oh. Well, it's set 172 years before. Oh. So, no. There's an actress that looks like her, but younger, so. No spoilers. Yeah. All right. I'll okay. give you a hint, Bill. They're related. They're related, okay. I thought it was the same person, so. It's not. Yeah. I'm going to start the show. All right. Fire up, Jimmy. And uh, for those of you who want to uh, participate in the conversation, uh, please join us on Discord. Um, that's where all the chatting goes on. Uh, we don't like Zoom chat. Zoom chat is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Illustration Isolation. Um, we have a fun night tonight. We've got a new series one of the prequels from uh, Game of Thrones that came out this last week. And we will be drawing House of the Dragon. And uh, there's some beautiful visuals in here. And I thought this would, uh, the, that the images I selected tonight will work well. So I'll run through them really quickly. Um, is it uh, Constantine? is uh, Patty, um, the, the, this, this guy's face is so terrific to draw. I mean, he's just, a, it's beautiful, it's, it's distorted. <laughs> I, I love this pose. I think it may, it's a great one to warm up on. Um, uh, really gonna be, uh, uh, I think, a really interesting one to draw. The, um, the second 20 minute pose, and again, we'll be doing two 20 minute poses in one, um, 30 minute pose, uh, excuse me, 40 minute pose, um, Millie Al Alcock. Um, the lighting on this is phenomenal. Um, the, the structure of the value, uh, color, all of that. I mean, it almost looks like it's, um, almost looks like it's a painting already. Uh, but I think it, it it's, it's very delicate and just, perfect, fits the character really, really well. Um, and then on your last pose, um, you have your choice of doing this image, which is absolute home run. I just, um, it's, a, it's a great pose, along with a very interesting looking individual. Um, how often have, I, I've never drawn anybody with uh, white dreadlocks before. <laughs> um, so, um, 
uh, how often do you get the opportunity to? Um, the it's it's just a great setup. So uh, you have your choice of doing um, this as the third pose, or you have the choice of doing the dragon. And oddly enough, there's not a great great a lot. Uh, there's not very many stills of the dragon that are are well lit or good poses. And uh, I don't know if they do that on on purpose. They're not promoting them. Could always, I guess, I could take the time to screen capture during the show, but um, I think they were saying it's it's like they've already this show showed more dragon time than they did the entire game Games of Thrones uh, in the first episode. So, hence the name, I guess. Um, so that's our reference for tonight. Um, during the evening, it would be great if you can post in between poses to hashtag illustration isolation in, on Instagram. And then we'll go through and take a look at the drawings at the end. Uh, Timmy, do you have anything you want to add? No, uh, I'll drop a link to the photos and uh, instructions on sharing. And just uh, just uh, please uh, keep the chat active on Discord. Um, it makes it more fun. All right. Um, you'll be paying attention to Discord, right, Timmy? Always, yeah. Here we go. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, let's get going. Uh, one last note I will say is please update your name. Uh, if you're joining us on Discord, update your nickname to your full name. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean you have to... Uh, um, you don't like dox yourself or something just it's only in our server and um, it's because we like people are a little bit more respectful when they use their real names <laughs> so please please do that I'm not going to upgrade the person that signed in with teeth collector <laughs> like, <laughs> Like if something goes wrong and you and they're like, whose account was it? <laughs> I totally trust them. I totally trust Teeth Collector. What are you talking about, Timmy? <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm sure they're a nice person, but uh, please update to your real name if you want to be part of the server. Yeah. Webinar Smasher. <laughs> that's like a that is like a game of thrones name yeah it feels like it master of webinars I feel a little off my game i was just at my daughter's orientation for kindergarten How's that go? Good. It's um like it's just exciting. I can't believe my my sweet little girls are ready to go to kindergarten. Ooh, that's a big that's a big moment. Yeah, yeah. And thankfully there was like a school bus out front so we could explore it and they could understand like because they've never ridden on a school bus and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. Were they excited or scared or? Yeah, they're really excited. Uh, they're kind of nervous, um, but their teachers are really, really nice. And I, I think I think it's going to be really, it's going to go really well, but it's it's a big step, you know? Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Cassandra, I was the youngest of three. We lived in the fairly rural area in Connecticut, and the bus came by every morning, picked us up in front of our house. And I always watched my sisters get on the bus as I was not ready for school yet. I wasn't old enough for school. And I remember the very first day of school, so excited that I was going to ride the bus. It was going to pick me up. They came and picked me up in a station wagon. What? And it was like, the route was so small. There was only like five kids. And so they used a, a station wagon. I was so disappointed. I wouldn't get, I wouldn't get in the station wagon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I boycotted. It's like, no, I'm in the bus. <laughs> I love that story so much. <laughs> I can picture that. My mom really loved it. She was like, I was so excited about the bus, but so upset when it didn't show. I mean, that is that is a letdown. I, I can I can see that. Yeah, it was a real letdown.
our biggest struggle is having to get on the the early morning routine like their bus picks them up at 7 15 a.m so it's so early that's that's incredible i can't even imagine that's yeah, like, like, trying so to keep it, like they're trying to keep it a secret or something <laughs> like, that's that's like what i would wake up if i was trying to surprise somebody like yeah yeah so i've been getting up you know 6 15 in the morning and trying to get them up at 6 15 and they are not excited about the time i've uh i've learned that i'm not a morning person <laughs> and i've most of my adult life forced myself to be a morning person and I've really become, I think, a better person just accepting that that's just not my, this is not my place. Mm -hmm. School turned me into a morning person. Not my schooling, taking my son, you know. Yeah. I did just the opposite. When my kids got into school, I started working all night, staying up at night, and then I would take them to school and come back and go to bed. Yeah. Wild. I did that for a long time, 14 or 15 years. Do you uh, feel like you operate better at night? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So much better. I can. I'm like neither a late person or an early person. I am like just awkwardly average in the middle. <laughs> I mean, Somebody said, making me sick with your late mornings. Well, my job also never ends. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of always happening and kind of not happening all the time. <laughs> well, that's what, the, that's what the illustration world was to me too. It's like, you know, it just never stopped, right? It's always, always going. I'm always, I, I was telling somebody, I'm always working like, at 20% effort, 100% of the time. <laughs> like, you know, I, I've interrupted some very fun evenings with emails and phone calls and technical support, uh, you know, but that's, but I feel very blessed. I, I feel lucky to be able to do that. I prefer it over the morning, morning stuff. I saw that Gianna had posted, it's just sort of like her, what, 13th year or something like that? Uh, something like that. 13 years teaching, teaching second and first, teaching, teaching, not just teaching one grade, but she's teaching second and first grade now. Aww. 13 years, pretty crazy. She seems, and I don't mean this in any negative way, but she seems too young to be a have been teaching for 13 years or doing anything for 13 years yeah the funniest thing is when like <laughs> this is the funniest thing is when we go to like a grocery store or something and a student who is like a grown man sees her <laughs> and will be like miss procopio That's and funny. she'll be like who are you and she'll be like you taught me when I was in first grade. Oh. And I'll be like, that guy was like, had a beard. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I'll be like, that's rough. And he, she, doesn't, she doesn't like it. But yeah. The, it's got to be so hard, though, at that point, because, you know, your mem you remember your teachers at that age. And then they come up to you and it's like, I'm sorry, you've changed a lot since you were seven years old. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot. It's, I think it's just convenient that they recognize her and they're not like, Mrs. Procopio? <laughs> 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 you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's always funny. The funniest thing is kids, because I remember this, like seeing the teacher out in the wild, like in their civilian clothes. That was the funniest. Like if you were at the grocery store, you're like, oh my God. It was like seeing a celebrity. Yeah, it's so like, true. You were just like, wow, they're just like us. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> so true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My my 
one of my really good friends uh, is a high school English teacher and she hates to buy wine or beer at the grocery store because she was like, all the kids that I've taught or teaching are um, uh, like work at the grocery store and I don't want them to see me buying alcohol. That's fine. I would, I would totally love that. I would be like, you see what you've driven me to? Yeah. I think, I don't know. I, I had a lot of, um, my teachers all seemed really young to me when I was a kid up until oh my God. middle school or something like that. Wow. When I think of my teachers, Bill, every single one of them, they just like, <laughs> there was a, there was a, a lady that uh, was the principal of, uh, it was a nun and she was the principal of our, our grade school, Prince of Peace. <laughs> and I would have guessed that she was like 90 when I was when I was going to school there. And my mom, like a week ago, was like, you know, Sister Mary Thomas saw her going for her walk, uh, like in the neighborhood this afternoon. And I was like, wait, is she 130? <laughs> like, couldn't believe it. Everybody oh, so has nuns. Okay, so that's a totally different. What's that? You had your teachers were nuns. Oh no, I only had a couple nuns. Oh okay. It wasn't like a nun, uh, um, like compound. It was. It was. There was a lot of. I mean, we did have at one point we had like, the like two nuns. Like it was almost a full Ninja Turtle situation. Like, it was like Sister Raphael. You're Michelangelo. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're like, are they just doing Ninja Turtle names now? Uh, but, yeah. Um, so I just remember my. I don't remember any teacher before first. I remember first grade teacher. Yeah. I remember second grade. I remember the third grade teacher. Um, a lot. It's pretty amazing how certain teachers just in general like can leave like I mean it's no surprise I guess but they can just leave an impression that like you remember them like perfectly but you only spent like one year with them yeah you know I mean it's, it's funny my third third grade teachers were young but my fourth grade teacher seemed really old but she's probably only 40 um yeah but I just remember her being really cool because um, she had kids. Uh, she invited us all to a, a, a par pool party at her house, I think at the end of the year. And um, she just seemed like a super cool person. Did you, have a crush, did you have a crush on her, Bill? No, I didn't. I had a crush on the third grade teacher and, and the other third grade teacher, but not, not the fourth grade teacher. <laughs> the, funniest, the funniest thing is, because uh, I asked Gianna about this, she'll be like, another kid accidentally called me mom today, which is like, <laughs> oh, when, oh, yeah. When that's like when I would die inside when I was in grade school. <laughs> but you'd be like, yeah, there's nothing more humiliating than accidentally calling your teacher mom. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I think especially at kindergarten age, like they're used to being mom slash teacher name. Yeah, yeah, they're just like, uh, and they immediately are like, uh. <laughs> so, do you do you guys have teachers, uh, art teachers that like massively impacted like your, I don't know that like changed your trajectory you feel like or oh yeah yeah I mean I remember I had an amazing middle school art teacher and she she really encouraged me to to work harder and she always um found a lot of his like public programs to be a part of and then my high school teacher she pulled together lots of the affordable like educational trips and so we went to Europe and I got to see, and like we did another trip to Egypt like, and they were all really, really affordable because she'd find grants and make it all work. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. I was, I was super lucky. Yeah. 
mean, we got to go to Disneyland in middle school. You know, that was that was kind of the big. Hey, that's still cool and fun. Yeah. We live in California, so you know. Um, that's very cool, Cassandra. Where did you grow up? Northern Virginia in Leesburg. Oh, okay. We were the capital of the United States for 10 days during the War of 1812. It's our proud moment. <laughs> I love how that fact is ingrained in your head. Oh, yeah. That's all we got, really. I, I think San Jose was the capital of California for like a hot minute before I grew up, but I, I couldn't be sure. Anybody else have any crushes on their teachers? I don't know that we need to go down that road. Um, <laughs> I thought I was really, I was like, that's in the past. <laughs> no, I'm just curious, was school, a, was school a positive place for you guys generally? Some parts of it. Yeah. Like, did you, John, did you like school? Um, like Bill said, parts of it. Um, yeah. I, I was a, just very active and social and yeah, uh, I was a total jock. And I say, were you a good student or? I was an okay student. Um, nothing um things i liked i did well at things i didn't like i i did pretty well and with math and um i was thinking well maybe, maybe now i'm thinking about it. i wasn't a very good student <laughs> I, I was I, I was an okay student um but i really was you know things i was just interested i paid a lot of attention to yeah Cassandra, what was your GPA? <laughs> um, so I was really bad at math because I a lot of things get flipped around for me. So I would always have to stay after. So I was um, I really enjoyed school, but I had to work really hard at it because I a lot of things would just would always get flipped around in my head. So I think I ended with like a 3.3 and a lot of it was like extra credit points for staying after and trying to find a, you know doing more work to make up for the fact that I didn't always test great. I asked because I figured you were definitely going to be like a 3.9 4.0 student. I just I did all the work but um I I'm not a great tester. Um Scantron really? is my enemy. Yeah. Oh yeah, and we both went to school, you especially during the time where like if you're bad at taking tests, like you were like screwed. Like Yeah, everything was defined by tests, so I would have to always go out of my white way to like do lots of extra credit to compensate for, you know, that area that I was weak. I retained the information really well. I just was I'm not great at testing, but I love books and I love information and so I I was very lucky that I had a lot of teachers that saw how hard I was trying and you know were willing to work with me so I, I really did enjoy school but I wasn't in any way like a standout but I did lots of extracurricular activities and just I, I liked any chance to learn stuff but just don't give me a test just we can talk about it at all or I'll write stuff down for you to prove that I learned it yeah But when I got to college, then it wasn't about Scantron. And then, yeah, I did really, really well. Right. I so there that. I graduated with a 4.0. I was a good student in college too. Um, again, when you, you, but you have a big advantage because you can really focus on what you want to study. So true. Well, and I also think like, because I struggled and I worked really hard, like when you, I got to school and you had to do lots of projects and you had to put time into stuff, like none of that was jarring to me. That's already what I was doing because I didn't, I didn't catch on quick.
was did you guys did anybody end up in detention on it no i never got really got in trouble yeah my brothers were the rebellious ones so i rebelled by not rebelling uh, i think i was in there a couple times but not too often bill were you always bill or were you ever a billy okay so <laughs> you know, my name is William, and um, I, my, my dad was called Bill, so for the longest time when I was growing up, I was Billy, and I was Billy up until I was about 14, and I was like, I'm 13, maybe 14, and I was like, yeah, I don't really want to be Billy anymore, um, so it was Bill. Uh, Here's a, here, this is a really good, I like this, uh, this education question uh, from, from Isaac. Uh, I'm a high school RT, especially because I think that you three have quite a bit of understanding probably of like higher level art education uh, or like finishing school. Um, so from Isaac, I'm a high school art teacher. Are there any habits or ways of work, ways of working that you wish incoming students didn't have or would abandon like once they got to art school. So can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like like what are the most like common bad habits that like high school art students have going into being young working artists or young young art college students? Oh well I the two that I've noticed is that they look at their phones too much and try to try to draw from looking at their phones and they zoom in to their phones to like, you know, get all this detail. So they end up over rendering things and not really understanding how to make pictures. Um, but also that and, and their way in, they're into the things that they're into. Like if they're into manga, yes, they're into manga. You know, and it's really hard to get them to see outside of that. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I think the most to try to get them interested in in drawing, because that's the one thing you can do at the high school level or any level is work on your drawing skill, yeah. and just to be practicing drawing. Uh, you know, I, I think I think it's really really important. I think I, but I do think that maybe the most important thing is for to get students to understand opportunity that can come from art. I mean, if they're if they're serious about if they really want to be an artist, they need to understand what the possibilities are. You know that you know I I don't know how many artists. I mean, well known artists that I've talked to that that's like, oh, I didn't even know you could make a living as an artist. Um, I've had so many people say that to me, and um, I think it's uh, to educate somebody on opportunities that exist, things you can do with art. But most people don't know. I mean, it's like my one of my favorite sayings is, you know, art students don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And um, they kind of, you know, try to figure it out along the way. And I don't, you know, I don't think that, well, there's some traditional education, you know, the education parts of traditional education that do good jobs at certain things. But the one thing I don't think anybody does a really good job with is, you know, helping people develop for industry as an industry artist. Um, not that, that, you know, not that everybody wants to do that, but, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that are, you know, stu young students that are interested in like them as gamers, they don't know all the possibilities that can come from, uh, you know, career opportunities working in the game industry or the animation industry or the film industry. Um, there's, you know, get the right skill sets and understand how the industry works and there's all kinds of opportunities out there. Do you think part of that too is, is educating their parents? 
Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, most, you got to do both, both sides. Most, most parents don't understand what, you know, what to do for their children. You know, I get calls all the time, you know, from people I know in Kansas City. It's like my kids are interested or my son's, you know, in grade school or in middle school. And where would they go to learn, you know, something uh, to, de to develop those skills? And because they're not getting it in their uh, school situation. Uh, there's, you know, so much better than it used to be. I mean, there, there was nothing going on in my high, high school art education. Um, and it's gotten better and better. I've seen, you know, really good high school art programs recently. Um, Well, I think to piggyback off of kind of what you were talking about, John, too, like going into art school um, with an open mind, because I can think of so many people like I went to art school and I was kind of running through all of these possibilities of what I could do or what I was interested in learning and how to focus my art. And like I was really scared I was going to be sick of it. So I, I, I luckily went in with an open mind to see where I best would be able to like study and learn. I thought I was going to go into painting and printmaking, but they were more focused on like more of a modern and impressionistic or expressionistic style. And I wanted to learn, you know, the human form and rendering and to be more realistic. So I, and someone recommended illustration. And so I went over there to be able to learn more that way. And it kind of set me up to be able to work in galleries and illustrate and be able to do it all. But if I went in just thinking I had to study specifically one thing, I could have missed a lot of opportunities. And so some, some people are going in like, I must be this specific kind of artist. And then they overlook maybe a niche that they would be better suited for because they were so focused on the thing they thought they wanted to be. You know, that makes sense. That's one of the best arguments I've heard for having professional artists teach art classes. Um, because people that are actually in an industry have, have a, I think, a greater awareness of what's going on commercially in that industry. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, you know, there's timeless things that you can learn from that there's, you know, I've seen really good instructors that teach, you know, kind of timeless information which relate to picture making, you know, learning about color, or, um, simple process, things like that, materials. I've seen good things there um, where at a certain level, if you, if you do want to be an industry artist, I think it's really important, like you, what Bill was saying, that there comes a time that you've got to learn from the people that are doing it as practice every day uh, because number one the industry moves and changes quite a bit and you know it's a really different making a living as an artist is a totally different world than teaching art um, and I've, I've i've done both and um, i don't think i could teach illustration or or a line of program for industry artists if I didn't have the experience of doing it for a very long time like I did. When I tell people that are trying to develop as, you know, that are going to grad school, that are trying to develop as, a, as an educator to, to teach illustration, it's like, please work in the industry before, for a while before you do that. I'm always saying that because it's a totally different world. Mm. And I always think about um, whenever anybody talks about opportunities and jobs and like John, you talk about your dad saying like, I don't buy any of this starving artist bullshit. Um, I always think tattoo artists, man, like tattoo artists make bank, like good ones do so well, have mm -hmm. really great 
have really great lifestyles and um it's just i don't know it's like the best like um rebuttal to like any parent that says like you can't make money as an artist like you can it's you have to be good but if you want to if that's the case you know it's like that's the first thing first you got to get good if you want to work in the industry you're good which, but you gotta you gotta probably, have, yeah which is probably true for like most careers you know right yeah but right. well a lot, a lot you a lot of careers I think there's more flexibility. I think there's a lot of jobs that people get, you're expected to get better once you get hired, you know, and some of that exists in the, in, in not in the traditional like editorial world. You're just, a, you just got to be good to compete. There's, I mean, cause you're competing with the best people almost immediately. I agree with that when you're comparing like uh, freelance work, to, yeah, pre, to, yeah, to studio. yeah yeah studio, yeah studio work you have more i think you have a little bit you still got to be good but i think they're much more willing and you know that knowing that you're going to grow and develop well because it's an investment for the studio right yeah. yeah yeah they're investing in your talent and investing in your ability where they think you will be in a few years you know um uh yeah it's interesting as a freelance, a freelance artist, well, there, there's a lot of freelance con- concept artists too now, but you know, you just, they want you for the skill. They want you for you being good. Okay. Well, on the topic of skill, we should move on to the next. I agree. Yeah. Um, so we are going to, we are going to move on to post two. Please uh, post your work to Instagram using hashtag illustration isolation. Nah, visual arts passage um somebody asked about what's going on with tara whitlatch and visual arts passage <laughs> um so i am going to do a brief little explainer for what is happening with visual arts passage uh we are doing our early bird enrollment right now uh for the fall semester and tara whitlatch is one of some incredible artists we've got lined up for the fall semester um if you don't know who tara whitlatch is uh, Terrell is an incredible creature designer, um, probably uh, best known, I mean, best known for a lot of things, but probably best known for Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, I think, um, but just, you know, has worked with George Lucas on like so many projects, incredibly talented, and Terrell is going to be joining us uh, as a guest speaker. So if you are a student of ours, you're going to have a chance to ask questions, connect with Terrell and attend a lecture with her. Um, other artists we've got, this is like gonna be, a, this next semester is stacked. Um, Keith Knight uh, is a cartoonist. I think Keith will be like our first like cartoonist with Visual Arts Passage, right? Like, right, John? Or maybe we've had, we have uh, anybody that like in, really specialized just in cartoons. Right, in, in that, well, um, Dustin D'Arnault. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of others that are in the visual development world that focus okay. on things that you know people that work for um, Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network, uh, but just as like a yeah a pure cartoonist, uh, you're you're probably right. Breaking ground. Yeah. Uh, Keith Knight uh, c- created the series Woke, which is on Hulu. Um, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, and it's it's like his story um, as a cartoon art, cartoonist um, living in San Francisco. It's a really great story. Um, and um, I think it's on season two on Hulu. So check out the show. Grace Liu, awesome character designer, works on Diablo 3 um and uh, league of legends sam hogg uh concept artist with blizzard dark horse comics uh gil ashby a lot of long time list long time illustration isolation listeners know love about. gil yeah gil is a special treat that i think he comes to illustration isolation like once a year um and he never tells us <laughs> <laughs> um maybe and- Wow. Yeah, and, uh, and then Lindsay Gallant, art director and CCO at Absurd Joy. So it's um yeah, 
Alana, Elena said Grace did a ton of work on Spider-Man and in the Spider-Verse. So like, yeah, that's this, good. this semester is killer. Um, so right now uh, we do have early bird sign up, which is a hundred dollars off. Um, and the discount code is just fall 100. It's easy. And if you follow us long enough, you'll learn that my discount codes are season plus the number we <laughs> are taking off. <laughs> so if you ever don't know what to enter. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just highly recommend checking it out, taking advantage of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to add to the question about Carol, which with talk and what's going on with the And those guest speakers in my mind are so important to our education. Um, the individual that asked the question about what you can do for your students is again, show them opportunities, show them things that exist in the industry that people, um, you know, their livelihoods are wrapped into, in, into their work and what they do. And the only way to be current with it is to bring lots of put to introduce lots of different artists to our students. And I've always put a huge emphasis on that. And I, I still think it's for somebody, for a student to see the opportunities created by people that work, you know, and, 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 you know, one showing somebody introducing them to one or two artists, that's okay, but it's very limited to show them lots of different directions, different parts of the industry that a lot of people didn't even know existed. And, um, I think that's one of the most valuable things you can do to educate uh, somebody, to, to, to help somebody better understand the skill sets that they need, listen to the stories, how they how those individuals developed, what they had to go through, what they had to ascertain as far as information. And um, it just makes you, it, it, it helps you align your path. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. And I should add, anybody who's wondering about, like, if they're just like, I don't know what these guys are talking about. This is, <laughs> this is in addition to our guest speakers are a big part of our courses. So you're, you're going to be learning um, a lot of, uh, a lot of information from our, our mentors, our teachers that teach these classes and you get put on a track where you're going to develop your portfolio. But like John was saying, like, a huge part of your portfolio, a huge part of um, creating goals and pursuing them is like understanding what is out there. Um, you know, you shouldn't be in a situation where you're like throwing a dart at a globe, you know? Um, well, you know, you know uh, I think um, if somebody's interested in comics or somebody's interested in character design and working in the animation world or um, everything, has specific skills um and or and well there's a lot of crossover skills too but there's things you have to focus on and things you have to put emphasis on uh the reason i brought up drawing at the high school level at an early level is it is across the board the most important tool uh that you're that that, that the average the average industry artist is going to use and so you're never going to be uh, wasting your time developing your drawing skill. Um, and there's, there's things that happen with your developing your drawing skill that, that, you know, it may not just be copying something at some, some point, it might be, um, you know, the sensitivity issue or help you helping you develop as an artist, uh, to, to approach drawings in different ways. And you just mature that way through your drawing and it's a consistent thread that goes through most artists, uh, careers. And so that, you know, the habit of carrying a sketchbook or drawing from observation a lot, learning how to render, those are all things that almost every that's required in every aspect of the industry, some much more than others. Um, so you cannot waste your, you're not wasting your time by practicing your drawing or developing your drawing. The other thing I think at a young age that, that, um, to introduce some type of process, you know, a way to, you know, the fact that we're in here drawing from reference, um, 
you know, thinking about composition, thinking about learning what a thumbnail is, learning how to develop a value study, a color study, and uh, learning that there's things that you can develop, there's methods that you can use that make everything easier and makes you more consistent as an artist and makes you a better artist almost right away when you, when, when, when you learn those skills. Um, so I think, you know, a good look at, you know, a, a brief understanding of process is really helpful at a, at a, uh, at a young age. I, I think that's, it's been, you know, I've taught kids at young ages and introduced a process to them. And it's been a huge help to them to get over hurdles. Um, problems that come up with an image that they can't figure out and solving things ahead of time at a thumbnail stage. Um, I think that's a huge uh, help. Yeah, any of them. And I, I mean, I, I've seen, um, I don't think it's healthy, but I've seen individuals that are, you know, far enough along where they, they finished art school and they're trying to figure out how to work in the industry and, and they've never been taught process. And I'm just like, um, the industries, you know, the animation world, the you know, game character development, uh, um, the um, doing environments, doing creature development, doing traditional illustration, it is all dependent on process. And, you know, that's why I'm, that's why I always suggest it's best to, um, along with any of your education, and if you're not connected to a working professional, you should definitely try to connect with one because they can explain what they do on a day to day and how they, how they use process to work in the industry, what's required of them. You know, everything, you know, in, in the, in the games industry, you're working with a team animation animation industry too you're working with a group of people as a traditional a traditional illustration route doing like magazine illustration or book illustration um, um you're working directly with an art director it's just one person the art director is subservient to their editor uh children's book illustration you're working with an editor a lot an editor and an and an art director um comics the same way editors are very important um, but you're, you're making a picture with somebody with a purpose and it, it the, the, it, you know, it's not just the physical part of the picture. It's the, the conceptual part of the picture is it is, you know, mo most picture making is divided in two directions in the industry. It's either, um, a conceptual problem creating a, an interesting idea to, to visually show a, a, a solution to something or telling a story, a narrative. Most things you see are narrative. Um, and learning how to visually tell a story is very important. So, there's so many, I mean, there's so much to put together to be good at it. Um, so anyway, hope, hope all of that makes sense. I think, I, I, I do think it's best that, that um, anybody developing look at the, you know try to figure out figure out from as many working artists as you can just try to you know introduce go to conferences um, you know pay attention to you know you know if you if you want to be a book illustrator go to a bookstore you know <laughs> look at what's being made look at the artists who are making them eventually you're going to have to identify who those art directors are because that those are you know that's who runs our industry from the artist side is that is is uh are, are the art directors we work for they determine hire that they, they you know they approve our projects uh so understanding what they do is critical well Just, i also, I also want to say just about um like the guest speakers and just getting to hear lots of different artists talk, especially such rock stars in the game. Um, it's also a beautiful thing to hear them talk about how they got to where they are. Like they weren't born a professional with it all figured out. Like they all had really interesting different journeys to get to that point. 
And it was amazing to kind of humanize them and realize there was a trajectory to somebody that you look up to so much and it made it seem more possible with hard work. And I always really appreciated getting to know so many artists through Illustration Academy and just see that these gods of art like were human beings that worked hard to get there and that helped inspire me to work hard. That, that you, you kind of just said something too. It's like the one most common denominator that goes along with the interest is the people that are willing to invest the time to work hard to develop because um, it does take a lot of hard work uh, to become good, uh, to become a mature artist, to become good at, you know, visual picture, picture making. I just, I just posted to Ocean, John, because Ocean was <laughs> asking about like gauging progress and stuff. And I was like, it's time in the game, not timing the game. And it's, it's about longevity, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I also, when I when I introduce students to um, to artists and the variety of artists, I try to instill in the students the the idea that there's a lot of prep work, there's a lot of things behind the scene that go into making a picture or making a thing that you don't see. Yeah, uh, I showed some students um, the movie Akira. The that they, these are students that knew the movie and loved it. And then I showed them an interview with um, uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, the man who created it, the anime and the director. Um, he did something like 2,500 storyboards for it before he ever shot a frame. Yeah. He did all of the storyboards for it himself because he really had a vision and just to uh -huh. think that idea that this is a process and there's a lot of hard work involved uh -huh. um and and that you know don't be afraid to work hard because good things can come of that um I think yeah i would imagine that if if that was overkill it was because a lot of it was probably frustrating for him as well I, I was thinking about artists that like I really like or that I'm like I'm maybe not that I even like like their work but that I'm interested in the artist so not even talking about the art I'm more interested in an artist that like had some struggle to be good you know I was I was reading about uh Scorsese Lawrence Scorsese the famous film director and like his career was my entire life he's been like an a-list director but like that is not true like he's had to like work his ass off and he's like had way more failure than he's had success um but he's also like the best like arguably one of the best directors of all time you know yeah like i love that i love that a lot more than like the yeah he's just a prodigy and just everything he does is like <laughs> Wow. No, he struggled. There's actually a really great story about him. Um, yeah. He was a huge fan of the director, um, John Cassavetes. Uh -huh. And he made this, and Martin Scorsese made this movie called Boxcar Bertha. Uh -huh. did, great title. Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Anyways, John Cassavetes, you know, his big hero, uh, the story goes like, you know, he's telling this story and, and he's like, John Cassavetes took me and he gave me a big hug and he's like, oh, you know, I love you. I love you. And he goes, then he pushed me away. And he goes, you just spent a year of your life making crap. That's not what he said, but yeah. um, uh, he said, isn't there something that you really want to do? Something that inspires you? Something that's based on your own personal experience? You know, something that you can relate to. And he says it really had an impact on him. So then he made the movie Mean Streets, which was his first, his first success and also his first film that had any kind of personal voice. And that's what, that's what put him down the path of making the kind of movies about, you know, this sort of gritty urban yeah. New York life. 
Um, so he won. Yeah, no, he he struggled. You know. Yeah. Um, and it's also interesting to me to know that like somebody at his level wanted, you know, he admired somebody and he was looking for someone's approval too. You know. Yeah. Um, and um and so yeah no he wasn't he wasn't always martin scorsese well generally to be good at anything you gotta work work hard at it <laughs> yeah. and art is one of those things yeah um, yeah it requires a lot of effort and Put your 10,000 hours in. Yeah. yeah, Malcolm Gladwell it. Yeah, and, there, and there's something that that there is, especially for uh, as an industry artist and illustrator, and a lot more ambiguity to doing fine artwork. There's a lot more that you can have a lot of a, a different discussion about it, but there are rights and wrongs and goods and good, there's good and bad. Uh, because there's things that have to have to work. You know, you can still be very creative, but there's a lot of information you have to acquire. Mm -hmm. That um, I really do think that you know there's 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 a lot the skill sets and the the information you have to have to acquire kind of establishes that that there's a lot of, you know, people say, well, it's, it's this aesthetic and personal taste. That's not always true as, as an industry artist. There's yeah. things that have to be done certain ways and there's skills that, that, that make that work. Yeah, just because Ocean kind of brought this up and I know that Ocean's like, we'll bring up like, you know, I don't feel like, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels, things like that's, those are her words or their words, you know, and, and like, I, I just think if you compare, first of all, you shouldn't be, you should not be uh, valuing, valuing yourself on other people's work. I think you can compare yourself to other people's work for professional development. And that's important, but your value is not in how you compare to other people and anything. And then, and then, the best way to probably assess whether or not you're getting better, you, you can't compare yourself like, are you better today than you were yesterday? You've got to do a larger aggregation of time. You have to start thinking, do I feel like more competent than I did? Like, you know, on average a year ago. Because right. I think if you're just comparing, like if you're just having a bad Monday, I mean, I... Bill, John, Cassandra, you you guys are in here all the time, and there will be a Thursday where you're like, oh, I'm just not feeling it tonight. Yeah. And you just have to accept that. It doesn't mean like, oh, oh am I, is Bill going down a bad path? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's just like, no, you're maybe you were tired, you know. That that's my thought. I don't know. I no, I, I think that's a lot. Of, there's so much truth to that. Like, when you're in it, it feels overwhelming, but yeah, sometimes you just have a bad day and a painting is just a struggle that normally wouldn't be a struggle. And you get through it and, and then you, you make it to the next piece and often it, it'll go better. But yeah, you can't judge yourself by like a rough week or a rough month. Like you just keep pushing. You just keep I'm not working. That. That. I'm not, obviously I'm not saying that with experience as an illustrator. I'm just saying that I think that that's a good life model <laughs> for like most things that have development over time you know mm -hmm. like i personally deal with that a lot with jujitsu like i'll just be like wow i guess i forgot everything <laughs> looks like this was all massive waste of time <laughs> and you just have to assess it based on large windows of time Cassandra, somebody asked earlier, how mm -hmm. do you uh, prep your cardboard before you start working? 
Oh, Gamblin's GAC 100. It's, it's my favorite, but any kind of gesso, just it makes the cardboard no longer be porous so that the paint will sit on top instead of suck it all up. So the GAC 100 is clear, so it leaves that natural color, cardboard color, which I always find fun to work with. Um, but you can use any kind of gesso and you're good. Someone asked earlier about, I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on this, but like learning as you get older, like, like learning painting and drawing. And I kind of want it to be a broad question. Like, what are your guys' takes on that? Like how you've adjusted, like trying new things or do you feel like going into new things? Like, is there a part of your brain that says like, None of you are old. I'm not saying that, but I do this sometimes where I'll, I will say like, like I feel this hesitation to try new things because I'm like, oh, I'm already this age. Um, but do you feel like the way you've learned changed as you've gotten older? Yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm a better learner. Yeah. Do you feel any differently about like your... Uh, like um, your uh, commitment to learning, I guess? I think, you know, when you're, when you're young, you know, school is something you have to do. And so you, you don't think about, oh, am I passionate about learning or am I, am I excited to do this? It's not as an active thing. When you get older, it becomes more of a choice. Like, oh, I'm choosing to learn. And to me, that's, that's more exciting. I had a, like family friends of my parents, their her her dad didn't start painting until he was like 65 and then like did really, really well with it and was like selling in all these galleries. I think he passed away in his 90s, but he became an extremely successful gallery artist. And he had never even picked up a paintbrush till he was 65. Like I think it's never too late and it's always exciting to just for the sake of enjoying it. I think that becomes more of a luxury as you get older and I, I think it's wonderful. That's amazing. Didn't even pick up a paintbrush. It's hope for me yet. That means I have 30 years before I have to draw with you guys. <laughs> oh, we're so going to make it happen sooner, Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> 31 years, actually. So, <laughs> yeah. And then I could still have an incredible career. <laughs> Well, you know, and I think, you know, look at some of the artists we truly admire, like Monet. I mean, he painted his, his whole life, but like, to, honestly, I think his paintings got so much more interesting when his vision started to go. Like he was really focusing on the lights and the darks and the color. And I just think it was exciting. Matisse's work, he, you know, changed dramatically because he had arthritis in his hands. And so he went to collage and focused on shapes. Like, I think that there's pros and cons to um, learning at different ages. So I think you just have to be open to adapting depending on where you are. A pretty gutsy thing to say about Monet, but I 100% agree with you. <laughs> well, uh, I really looked I, into it because I, this vision went. And when I had that vision issue. You may have heard me say it before, but I was like, I, he's one of my favorite painters the last 25, 30 years of his life, I thought his, uh, he would not have been one of my favorite painters if he didn't continue to paint after his 50s. Mm -hmm. wow. I didn't find his work very interesting, but it got really good later yeah, on. Yeah, it did. <laughs> also just, he was much freer in terms of his, yeah, like he got there faster, you know, it wasn't just his vision, it was it was the way he saw, it was the way he thought. Um, yeah, his time spent working, and, you know, um, speaking of vision, I can't see your face at all, really. Um, I'm so proud of my mom. So she retired a few years ago and picked up, like started taking book binding. And now she's gotten so good and she, you know, helps all the libraries in the county and book binds, like fixes their books for them. And 
just like what a wonderful path she's taken since she's retired and she only picked it up a couple of years ago. That's cool. That's really cool. I, I had somebody say to me a while ago and I, I, it really changed the way I pick up on new things and, and try new things is I was like, uh, I wanted to get into like Muay Thai and I was like 29 and I had not done like any combat sports or like jujitsu or anything like that. And I was like, I don't know, I'm like 29. I think I'm just probably too old to like pick up a hobby like that. And they're like, no, dude, like if you do it now in five years, you will have five years of experience doing it mm. and you'll be 35. Like, that's great. And, um, and it's really cool because that's like completely what it, I don't know. There's something about that that really helped me like, be like, yeah, of course, like a year from now, I will have a year of experience and that's fantastic opposed to none. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I have a bit of dread sometimes in trying new things because it can be scary or, or like learning a new thing. Like, it, you know, um, it's, it's, you have to be vulnerable to, to yeah. accept that you don't have that information and that you need to learn. And yeah, that's, that's tough. Oh my gosh. I took a friend, uh, climbing with me and, uh, this, this person is a, a good friend, but very insecure and also has like no experience climbing. And it was like the most incredible experience. Like, because that's like a thing that like allows no ego. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's not like basketball, like where you can pretend you're good and like, you know, like call the three pointer before it goes in. And like the fallout is it just doesn't go in. But like with climbing, if you like pretend you're good and you're not good, like the, Get fall. The, the, repercussions, <laughs> the repercussions are serious you know and it was so interesting to see like how reserved he became and like just kind of pulled back a little bit and was just not a pleasant person for the experience um and it was and it was entirely like you were saying Cassandra it was this like unwilling to be vulnerable and just be like, yeah, I'm not good at this. This is a new thing for me. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, you know? Yeah. Well, was, it was a, we had a pretty good time though, Timmy. Yeah. So. John. <laughs> <What's up? laughs> John, there's no way you would ever let me belay you. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is, but uh, uh, that's where I hold this, one this, the, the sounds of it. No, I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, I uh that's when I can I do know what that is. Okay, I was gonna say you wouldn't let me do it. That's like a Game of Thrones problem right there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would you would hear it if you like da 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I was in a place today where they they had climbing, you know, but you really had to be an you know, you had to be an experienced climber to do it. And I was totally like I'd like to try this climbing. I'd like to climb the side of this rock. You know, this could be. Yeah. Do it. You know, I will say this, like I was, I was hiking today. I went up to this, uh, to Pilot Mountain, which uh, to take some photos and, and I was hiking and I was going up the side of this uh, peak. And I gotta say like all the time that I've spent running in the last two years, really paid off when it came to hiking up the side of this mountain oh you've been you've been doing so good i'm so impressed by the miles you get in bill oh thank you um but you know like i was like you know there are people that were struggling to get up that mountain and it wasn't that you know it wasn't that difficult but i was like all right at 57 i'm i'm trucking up this mountain like it's no problem and um, a lot of that has to do with all the running I've put in, and all the, I don't know, I don't think there's ever a point, I don't know, well, maybe there's a point when it's too late for certain things, because just certain things you can't do, but. It's never too late, Bill. Brian's not one of them. Yeah. You know, never too late. Um, I come out. You, you told me you wanted to be like a UFC fighter or something, I think I'd 
Well, that, that, that's not in my future. <laughs> that's okay, though. Uh, yeah, I, I can live with that. You know what? If you did that, though, we 100% would sponsor your first fight. <laughs> <laughs> we would buy advertising for that. Um, <laughs> no, that, no, Timmy, the smart way to do that is say, you know, we would sponsor your third and fourth fight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because the odds are there's not going to be one yeah so, oh my god i love that you think that there might be a second one though <laughs> should we move on to the next pose 100 um, percent okay. on the next pose and i i think i'm done with this pose so so we're moving on to pose number three this is our final pose um it's going to be probably like only like 30 minute pose. Um, so uh, please post your work to, to Instagram with uh, hashtag illustration isolation. No, uh, in climbing, there's a really cool thing that I really like because you have a, and I'm sure if somebody's attending that has like way more experience than me and they're going to be like, you said this wrong or whatever, but there's like a system. There's a system for climbing, obviously, and there are pretty strict rules. It probably varies by region on like what the expectations are or like how to do it. But like, and there, I know there are like a couple different knots, but you have like a partner and you're both very much responsible for each other. And one of the things that I really like about it is like you tie a knot and then your partner is supposed to inspect the knot. And if your partner doesn't like the look of your knot and they say like, hey, your knot looks kind of weird. Like it doesn't look like it's done right or it's a little loose or you should redo it. There's like kind of a rule that like you have to respect that critique and redo your knot. Mm -hmm. There's no like bickering of like, no, this is how I did. Like, it's just fix it. Yeah, I mean, that's safety. <laughs> um, and so I really like that because um, me and Gianna, for the most part, me and my wife lay each other and we can be kind of um, like an old married couple sometimes with like our, our like bickering. <laughs> And that's like the one thing we've like learned, like, it's like really great. Like you just, you're like, I don't like how that not looks. And you have to like, accept that you can't just be like, leave me alone. <laughs> you know? My not is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, you're just picking on me because, of, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I saw this um, this clip of this woman. She's like a nun, and she's ninety two, and she just finished like she's done like uh, an insane amount of Ironman and mar like marathons, and like yeah. it just shows her finishing. I think another Ironman at ninety two. Wow. Does she like explain what her secret is? They always explain it, and it's always like weird. Usually, no, she, there was no explanation. It just showed her crossing the line at ninety-two. <laughs> and you said she was a ninety-two-year-old nun. Did you? Yeah. Say I'll make that up. Yeah. My head. Okay. Not the nuns have come up a lot tonight. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, that's funny. I wonder what the routine is. Maybe it was. I did a lot of marathons. <laughs> yeah. If you just keep moving forever, you know, you won't, you won't stop moving. Human body is interesting that way. It's like the more you use it, the better it works. Uh -huh. Very few things you can compare that to. Mm. Yeah. Like, like the new Tesla doesn't do that. <laughs> 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 like, 
quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Where do you do you all have I do you all ever spend any time thinking about where you want your art to be in 10 years or 15 years or yeah okay. well not necessarily in timelines but I have like a list of goals of uh -huh. you know I hope to get to and then I then I think about what are the steps that need to happen in between do you think it's important that you set, like, you say, okay, it's 2022, I want this to happen by 2027, or do you think that that's a little less important than identifying the, the desire? For me, the timeline, like, nothing in my life has ever gone to the timeline at all. Uh -huh. So, like, for it to happen by a certain year is not necessary, but just for me, writing down where I what I hope to do some things I hope to accomplish just helps keep my mind set on pushing above where I am so that I am continuing to push myself to be better like I can always get better yeah I imagine it also keeps you from maybe getting like distracted by things by like other life things that like I don't know. Well, it also keeps my focus on like, it's not about comparing myself to others, but more just identifying people who have taken certain tracks and admire it and see what did it take for them to get where they got and what is it, what is it going to take for me to get where I want to go? Yeah. But like, you know, for example, there's certain galleries I, I want to make it into, um, but I know price-wise I'm not there yet and I, I'm just not at their level, but I'll see what galleries they're looking at that are kind of on lower tiers of, of price and, you know, try to work with them and get in with them to make myself, you know, because not only working with them is amazing, but it also makes me a bit more visible in, in directions that I'm hoping to be. And that's kind of helped me kind of stair step up more. Yeah. It's, I have to think about like what I wanted years ago or a year ago, and then like assess if that's occurred in some fashion. Because when I don't, I just feel like I haven't succeeded at all. And it's really easy for me to actually achieve milestones that are really great um, or exciting or things that I should be proud of, but just like, they just like happen and it's not, they happen so slowly, they kind of sneak up on you and you don't, I think, appreciate the moment, mm. acknowledge, acknowledge the forward momentum, you know? has that been an experience? I mean, like John, like was like when you, you know, did like a Newsweek cover, were you like freaking out or were you like, I, you know, you were probably like, I put in the work, I'm here. Right. Or what was the experience like for that at that time in your life? It was a, it was a good experience. It sure. Felt, yeah. I, I, I felt like I, I felt like I was ready for it. Uh huh. Um, I don't know if I, you know, I was 31, 32 years old. I've been working at it for 10 or 12 years, you know, really hard. And um, yeah. Was there like a time in your life where you acknowledge like, wow, that's an, like only so many people have done that. Like, you know, it's like, it's a pretty incredible achievement. Yeah, like, I mean, when you got a time cover, like that's that's huge. It's such a small group of people that can say that. Right. 
Yeah. Right. Well, after you know, like bask in it in front of all of us, but <laughs> I, I I I never did a time cover. I did a bunch of news newsweek covers. And I was I was I I kind of figured it out later that well, I probably never would do a time cover because I kind of played for the other team. Right. Um, but that oh maybe that's what I was thinking of because it looked like a time cover because you're worthy of time cover. But but that that was okay. I mean I it, it, you know, I, I felt like I was accepted into, you know, it was like the the first time I could say I was doing things at a level that, that some of my heroes were. Mm. Yeah. And that, that, that was a good feeling. Was that kind of a breakthrough role for you, the Newsweek cover? Um, I guess. I mean, uh, I, I'd done things that were I had been in, I, I, it was funny, I did this uh, work for um, an advertising agency where I did a, it, it was for a huge student loan company uh, called Hemar, and I did a whole bunch of uh, black and white drawings that appeared full page in Time Magazine for like two years. Wow. And so it was like every time issue, I had a piece inside it for like yeah. two years. It was pretty cool because it was an ad they kept running. Um, and I thought, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I did. I was lucky to get to do things. Um, I, I bombed out on a couple of movie posters that I, 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 mean, I think I did OK with the, the pieces that they just never went anywhere. Um, I wish I wish I would have. Uh, the movie, um, The Bird, starring Forrest Whitaker, that that uh, um, Clint Eastwood directed. I did several versions of that, and they ended up going to photog. They ended up using photography. I was kind of bummed about that. I oh. that was, you know, uh, and I like the <laughs> wild guess. I the movie, and I don't know it, but I'm I've got a feeling that that's not the only thing that bombed with that movie. Is that accurate? That well, was a good movie. It was pretty oh, good. Movie. It was a good. It was a good movie. I mean, that's, that was one of the, the 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 things that 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 bothered wow. me. For wow, you're a good company though, because I happened to Wilson Carrots with uh, Unforgiven. Yep. You know. Um, no kidding. Yeah, although they did sort of use a design that, um, you know, I learned a lot from what he did. Um, I, I can relate to that. Um, yeah, man, your piece looks so good, John. Yeah, it does. God. I think it's a um, disaster. <laughs> it <laughs> it is not looking like a disaster. It's a disaster right now. It's going to come together, I, I think, but it's, uh, I don't know if it will in this time period. It's so good. I'm kind of hating you right now. So, no, it's really nice. Um, but the, the, when I did the fireman's fund work, you know, and it was in um, the New York Times magazine and Architectural Digest and a bunch of other magazines, um, one of my friends was like, "Yeah, your your stuff is everywhere. I'm sick of it." And this is an artist who had done a lot, had you know, a lot of editorial work and a lot of, done a lot of high profile work. So that that felt kind of good. Uh, even though it wasn't like a cover for the New York Times or, you know, the magazine or whatever. Uh, you know, just verification, seeing your work printed. I mean, that's a big thing for illustrators. I mean, lo nothing like going into a, like a, to a magazine kiosk and seeing your work there. Mm. That, that's, that's a cool thing. Um, so I, I, I was always excited about seeing stuff printed. Yeah, that, that never got old. I, I love that feeling. That's yeah. That's so cool. But I've I've narrowed my focus. I've changed my focus too many times and I'm just I'm really focused in on just a couple of things right now. Yeah. And it's making so, life easy. Somebody opinion. told me a while ago, I really like this phrase, and I had never thought about it. And I wish that somebody had said it to me when I was like getting out of college but like we're all really focused i think especially like a western or american concept is like you have to succeed 
and like your success, your, your value is like very, very much attached, attached to your success, you know? And so we're all going to just like put all of our effort into trying to succeed and climb a ladder. And this person was like, make sure your ladder is leaned up against the right wall (laughs) because like there's a really good chance you're gonna climb it and you're where you want it to be is not actually there um and I've seen like a lot of people do it's especially because I think I'm at that age that age right now where everybody does start to assess like are they happy with their careers and where their life is going I'm 30 I'm 30 I just turned 34 um and like a lot of people I know are like I think I've leaned the ladder up against the long, wrong wall and they're like kind of reassessing it mm. um, I don't know well something to think about is as an artist it's like um you, you part of part of it even you know fine artists painters illustrators you fail a lot <laughs> mm. it's like understanding that that's part of it you, yeah. you're not gonna you're not gonna always win you're not gonna always get the job you're not gonna and sometimes you're not gonna even do a good job with the job it's something you know you've got to be competent it's got to be professional but sometimes you just don't do a good job with it you know, and I, or, you know, you struggle with it, kind of like I'm, you know, right now. Struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling. Just mine, mine is struggling just a little bit more. Exhibit A. <laughs> I had a, I mean, I pretty much got out of filmmaking because I was hired to direct a music video for like an up and coming band. I was hired by uh, whatever the YouTube, I think they got a quite like Vivo or whatever. Um, and it was a huge project and I just had no experience working with producers. They took it over. I was actually telling this story to Salacuse a while ago. I was telling him about like my worst set experience. I was like, I basically was the director and I became the cameraman and, oh. it, and it just went horribly. It just, I, I screwed it up at every, Every spot where I should have turned left, I went right. It was so bad. I mean, and <laughs> and I just was thinking what you were saying, John, about like, it just goes bad and you just have to accept it. Um, like, I remember Joseph Gordon-Levitt tweeted about how excited he was for this music video to come out. And I remember being like, I have to bury this thing. <laughs> like, it was so bad. And it, I ended up making it, I tried to edit it so badly that it would just never get released. That was my goal. Mm. Like, I would imagine with illustrators, does that, have you ever heard of like a job like that happening where you're just like, this is, they went with the wrong concept. Like it has it happens, to be. It happens all the time. You're just like, oh my God, I don't want my name anywhere near this. No, it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, you just have to do those and then move on. To the next one. The, the, the tricky part, I think people learn to identify those things. Yeah. Or, you know, figure out how to identify when that is going to happen. Uh-huh. And I and I think it's it's a real talent. And well, it's just a sign of maturity that somebody can identify it. Um because you know it's like yeah. They, I was I was young, I was like 26. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's common stuff. I mean, you know, things can get over art directed. They can go a different way. I mean, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of nasty things that can happen to illustration projects. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. I remember part of the contract, they, they had all these contracts coming through. And one of the contracts was like, cause in my mind, I like, I would see these like, like Kanye music videos and stuff. And I was like, I want to be like a director like that at some point in my career that like does like big commercial shoots and then does music videos. And part of the contract said that like as a director, like I would get acknowledgement in this music video because it was going to be a major music video. And like music videos, like don't really get budgets anymore. They don't like studios don't 
produce studios don't like produce at that level anymore. And part of the contract was like, it's gonna say directed by Timmy Trayvon at beginning and end. It's a huge deal. And then I just remember being like doing whatever I could to be like, whatever happens, it just needs to not say directed by. <laughs> I was like, I gotta get that out of the contract. <laughs> Yeah. I'll also never tell anybody the music video because I'm terrified of it ever actually turning me out that it's like on some website. <laughs> like my the wife, numbers going up. I'm Googling it right after this is over. So. No. I only did one full complete book, a picture book, and it turned out to be the biggest nightmare. And and, yeah. I, and I did like three pieces out of 17. It's traditional the picture book, you know, 16 inside images and um, one cut in the cover. And I was really proud of like three of the pieces. And they were the very first three that I did. And then we, I, got, I got really sideways with the art director that they, actually they changed art directors and they came up with this new direction for the book in the middle of what I was doing. and. Oh. My, my God, did it go south. Oh, and, no. And I just, horrible experience for me. Um, I'm like I, stressed for you just hearing you tell this story. Well, it's, it's like entombed in my, I have it wrapped like all 17 images. Well, no, I have the cover out because I like the cover. I have um, everything wrapped in cardboard and plastic and taped up in it and it's like do not open <laughs> I, I, I don't want to i should burn it but uh, um you know it's like i got all my old illustration work art you know put away <laughs> and this thing is no nobody's ever gonna see it that's one of I love oh, now that. I'm dying to see it. <laughs> I love that. That John, that's like that's like the signs they put up at like decommissioned nuclear sites. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like don't don't. They're like it needs to be made of symbols so a hundred people a hundred years from now people understand it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've I've got jobs like that. You know, jobs yeah. that sell print and. You know, you know, learning to navigate those issues is a, you know, is an important thing. And boy, I, I, I thought I had it and it didn't work out. Yeah. You know, and I, I mean, I think a lot of us start out young and we are learning and we're getting paid to learn. Um, You know, you. It takes a while, I think, to do something to even at a professional level. You know, it takes a while to do something at a professional level to get proficient at it, so that you know, not just doing the work, but dealing with the those kinds of issues that come up. You know, and uh, it can be real. You know, I remember when first time somebody altered my work digitally, and. I went ballistic, you know. Mm. I had a thing in my contract where I charged people three times the purchase price if they altered my work. And I charged them, I billed them for it. And, uh, but it was just one little job. And now if somebody, I don't think I would react the same way, you know. And even on, even, you know, in comics, you're working with the writer a lot of times. And sometimes you have a really great working relationship, and sometimes it can be really difficult. Um, and you can't, you don't know that sometimes until you're in the middle of it. Um, and just knowing how to negotiate those situations it takes yeah. time and maturity, you know. So I handled it by, I went, <laughs> I went back to my West Bottom studio and just tried to be unavailable for like a week. 
Yeah. And just, just was dodging phone calls. I mean, I was like a wanted man. It was so bad. <laughs> That's something I've never. Oh man. Never just. Jimmy, I got to see this video. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's not even like good, bad. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's oh not yeah. Like, yeah. Just like absolutely just stupid, just boring. And just, that's the worst. It's boring. It's not even like, like I follow an Instagram that's just like bad music videos. It's not even like that. It doesn't even qualify for that. Like I totally know what you're talking about. Where like it's not even interesting in its like terribleness. Yeah, it's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I think and, that like, not shot well. <laughs> I'm saying this for the purpose of the room that you know one of the especially my time period as an as an illustrator being you know getting your work in the society of illustrators was kind of like a you know a badge of honor and it was also really important for your career now there's lots of other places besides it but it was like really the the place it was like letterman right it was like yeah getting it, letterman. yeah yeah and so um thing ever. i remember doing this piece for um guidepost magazine and it was you know not a not like a, they bought, they used a lot of good illustrators, but it wasn't like the creme de la creme of illustration work. But they used good people, and it was a uh, it was a good client, fun to work for. And I did this piece that I it was I thought it was the worst illustration I've ever done. It was just so straightforward. I was trying to do something different, and it just I I bombed on it. And so I did something kind of to make up for it, and I sent it in and. They never said anything. They printed it. They really, you know, the art director sent me a note back, note back and they hired me again afterwards. A year later, um, I'm looking at the, I get my society of illustrators and I'm so excited to see if, you know, I knew I had, well, this was before because I knew I'd gotten pieces in. Um, I did not realize that, that the art director submitted my piece to the society of illustrators and got it in. <laughs> Oh, and I, I was horrified. I was just like, <laughs> I cannot believe that this piece is in here. Oh, and all the people in the in the industry that I'm trying to uh, you know to impress are looking at my worst piece I did for the year. Um, but and uh, yet it was still good enough uh, for the society. John, I don't know if this is too cringe for you to talk about, but the Kansas City did, was it the Casey Star did an article about you, and they they meant to. You sent that like they didn't they use a reference photo or something? Yeah, it, it, there was a story. It was like this whole <laughs> circular story. So bad. And, and I used one of my best buddies, who's a really successful business guy here in town, as a model. And I didn't do the illustration. It, my dad did the illustration. It was a story. It was for um, um, the big uh, private. Uh, Gulfstream, um, private jets. And uh, it was a portrait, it was a painting, like three quarters painting, uh, bust up from, uh, of Christopher Columbus. And my, and it was a story, it was a story was about, you know, how this all got put together, that um, my father got the commission yeah. I, I shot some reference for him and then it ended up being, you know, on the, uh, you know, this great poster, this great piece my dad did, which was a completely secondary thing. They came to interview me for my illustration work, talked to me about what I was doing. And I had that conversation. I showed this, you know, I talked about how it all got put together and that's what they ran as oh, yeah. the artwork. So I, I, I got this phone call from my friend who modeled for it and he's he said have you seen the newspaper today and i was like no i haven't i haven't looked twice well, said, what's he goes like your article i just looking at your article and i said okay i said well was what'd you think and he said well i think you need to really look at it <laughs> yeah. I, I i had never been so horrified in my life 
And, you know, mm-hmm. this, my buddy, who's like this real successful businessman here in Kansas City, is dressed up like Christopher Columbus. <laughs> in my studio, he, he looks like a cartoon of Christopher <laughs> Columbus. And, oh, it's just, it was awful. It was awful. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. I love hearing cringy stories like that. Mm-hmm. So, like, what did you do when you saw the paper? Like, what did you say to your friend? Like, I won't make you dress up like I, I, you know, I apologize. And he, you know, he was a good friend. I mean, he's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I, I, I don't really care. Although I know he did. Um, he was just, he was good to me, he was kind to me. But <laughs> was he talking to somebody later? He's like, oh, yeah, whatever you do, just don't pose for John. Just, 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 <laughs> well, yeah. the, the, the funniest, funniest part was, was really quick, everybody, five minutes on this last post. Sorry, John. The, the funniest part was it was actually, you know, it was my dad who, you know, it was it was his artwork, not mine. Yeah. And it was just an awful situation. <laughs> sorry to make you relive it for us oh that's so funny yeah that's like super cringy okay. yeah that that was not a good thing but i, I you know i do think it's a, it, it, you know young artists that that's a something that they really have to learn is how to how to fail um how to recover from failure and and just assume that they're going to learn that they're going to fail some of the time. Um, yeah. Good artists, really great artists fail more than they succeed. Um, I'm proving sure. a question uh, from Sylvia. Um, you know, can you talk about how to answer people who ask for, I'm going to make it a little bit more of a simple question, but like people who ask for work and then they say like they, they have a little budget, like they have a small budget. And like, how do you deal with people asking when they don't, you know, have a budget, um, which correct me if I'm wrong. It's like, as you gain, gain, you will gain experience negotiating and developing probably a better understanding of the value of your time and the value of your work. And you have to, you have to find an in between, between the budget and your time, you know? What do you guys think? Well, you, yeah, I mean, if they can't pay you, you shouldn't do it, obviously. Absolutely. And, you know, there's certain things, there's certain jobs you do because there's yeah. value of doing that, that job. You know, the, exposure cool. the, that coolest work, the coolest work I've ever done is because I did a free job. Yeah. I mean, but I know people hate to say, hear that and stuff, but like I did a job for Jeremy Collins uh, for free I edited a trailer for a movie he wanted to make and I got to travel like all over the world with him and go to film festivals I got to I made a movie with him um, and it was because I did a free job you know and that that does happen it's rare you got to really trust the person well so I mean I think you're even you're saying it in this story that like you have to assess first off is it any, is it something worth you doing? If you're going to do it for free, like it better be something that you really want to do. If you don't, uh, as politely as you can, uh, just say, thanks for the opportunity, but uh, I'm, I'm going to pass on focusing on jobs that are paying right now. You, you know, like yeah. it's okay to say no. And sometimes people prey on the possibility of you, like not knowing how to say no, like yeah. you know not always intentionally maliciously but sometimes they're like oh I think I can get this person to do it because they're focused on their thing but it's okay to say yeah. uh thanks but no thanks um I appreciate you thinking of me and I, I've I've said that to to people before but like I appreciate that you considered me for this but uh it's gonna be a no for me on that but good luck and I hope it works <laughs> out I'm gonna, that's gonna be a no dog <laughs> yeah. uh yeah um I wouldn't, I would always say like, don't be like pissed off. Like, I think especially when it comes from like a civilian, you know, like an aunt or like a friend, I think you just got to be like, ah, this person just doesn't know. And they're just guessing and people 
you know, perhaps they are a cheaper person. I would say like avoid taking it personally. The one thing I'll say about like taking, like, cause I want to say like, I was presented with an opportunity. I did not know Jeremy Collins at the time. Um, he was not as big a household name as he is now, not household name, but like he's known at what he does. Like he's a really successful climber, artist, whatever, adventurer guy. Um, but I was presented with an opportunity and I met Jeremy through John and Sterling Hundley. And Jeremy was like, hey, if you edit this trailer for me, if we can get the funding for the movie, I'll hire you as the editor. And the first person I called was like John. And John was like, I don't really know him. You should call Sterling. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and Sterling was like, he's a good guy. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And because I've also done the exact same thing that I just said for major agencies that were doing a pitch for a major sporting company and they say if you edit it we'll give you the job they got the job and then all of a sudden they weren't answering their phone calls (laughs) you know so it's like you just gotta there was no trust established that was the issue is I didn't assess like is this person being honest with me and so that's where you gotta be or even is the risk worth the thing you know, you didn't know him. You tried to get as much information as you could and then decided it was worth the risk to do it for free. And yeah. it, it turned out wonderfully for me, for you. Also, you know? also, it was one of the, that was a time in my life where like I was trying to establish a career and I did not have like, like it depends on where you're at. Like John, there's probably a time in your guys, I'm sure there's a time in your guys' career where like the risk isn't worth it because you're giving up paid work. Mm-hmm. to do that and you can't do that well then there's it, it, it depends how good it is you know it's like if it's really great you want to be you still want to do it i always want to i don't want to ever be in that position if there's an opportunity that's a great opportunity to not be able to do it yeah I have a, yeah 100 yeah i have a person right now that has an edit for a thing that would be a dream a dream edit for me and I'm just like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I just want to do it. Doesn't, yeah. Don't even tell me about it. Like, I don't need to know about the money. That's not good advice. <laughs> but I. Uh, no, it is. It's good advice. It's really? very, it, yeah, it's very good advice. If it's something you really want to do and you believe in it, it's, it, you got to, you got to leave, leave room for. Yeah. You to be able to do those things. Yeah. But. I also, um, like, that's like the, yeah, it's, it's what's the cost for you too. Like the cost of me doing that is not expensive, you know? Like I could see like a mural artist, like there's, you know, there are hard costs, right? You got to assess that. The, the, it, it's but like, there's also a learning curve. Like if you want to get trusted on big jobs, you have to be able to have like the portfolio to show it. So, you know, some of the muralists in the city, they need to find a wall that someone will allow them to paint for free uh-huh. so that they have a portfolio to build upon for the bigger job. So, you know, like you have to take it all with a grain of salt and just figure out like, what are you trying to accomplish or is it something you want to do? So if you need the wall to get the experience, then you, you do it for free if you can, if you can afford to. Yeah. The most successful photographers I know always have a side project that they're doing, that it's a free project, but it's something that they really care about. Um, and it's kind of a personal project. Um, that's the difference you know if it's something that you care about and it's your own thing yeah then you don't lose anything by doing it it's but they're always sharing it with somebody it's not like just this is my photo series on this it's a an interesting situation right right i mean i've never felt yeah i've never felt bad about doing something yeah really if i thought it was a good cause or if it was something that i really wanted to do or if it was yeah that was going to help somebody it's when somebody asks for something 
that has a value and they don't want to pay that value uh -huh. then when you this has only happened one time when you mention what that value you know the value of what what you you're doing they act like they're doing you a favor for asking you to do something for free right and that you should if you were a professional then you would do it for free and i'm like what mm. oh yeah mm. well the, no. the other the other really important thing to point out is that most of the th projects that we're talking about and what we work on you know the people in this room we're buying you know you know people are buying our artwork that are accustomed to buying artwork for projects and it's like they're knowns they're they're standards in the industry there's and it's when you get into like timmy said at the beginning it's like if you're doing something for your aunt or you're doing something for a friend of a friend that doesn't understand how that part of you know how the industry as, aspect of it works that's when you run into problems and that's where i've you know working in for you know the for years i'd always kind of dread getting a, a project from and this is nothing against Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I'm just using it as an example. But I, wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say that's the illustration hub of the world. But <laughs> yeah. there was an agency that found me from there. Yeah. And I did a project with them. And it was like, oh, my gosh, it's like they'd never bought, you know, artwork from anybody before. Mm -hmm. and, and so you get into a smaller market or just work with somebody that's just not accustomed to doing it. That's when you run into the issues. Yeah. And you learn to to assess those things along the way and find, you know, figure those things out. Best best advice I've ever had with like negotiating is um, it's better to get to know fast than hover around a yes for like weeks. Just throw out the facts, be respectful and just get enough. Don't be afraid to get a no quick. It's it's worth better your time. Guys, it's already it's already seven past seven fifty. So John, we should probably. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do it. Um, I don't think I'm going to save this thing in this time. I just want to. I just want to, in case there's like a person that's like gonna shorten what we just said. We are not saying do work for free. No. We are just not like the first, the we first are just person. acknowledging that there's like a nuance to it. Yeah. That there are opportunities where it. It yeah. can be beneficial, but there's many opportunities where it's someone taking you for granted. So what we're really saying is assess, even if it's for free, is there value for you in taking it? And what right. is that? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and. Um, yeah. Because yeah. there's going to be a lot of people knocking on your door for free stuff. It's it's like hilarious. I was last laughing to, you know, one of my friends of a you know medical profession and I was like. I mean, everyone expects that I should be able to do things for free and I make a fraction of what you do, but they're not coming to you for the free stuff. Yeah. Cassandra, I, I paid, oh, I paid for my, my son's uh, um, braces <laughs> by trading artwork. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. I, I, yes. I so many different things I bartered and it's like, you know, you know, the, they're saying, well, I'd like this, but I can't afford it. And it's like, okay, well, tr trade with me. And yeah. I've, done that. I've done that on a couple of things before. Uh, That's like my go-to line. Like, you got a nephew that wants to go to art school? Like, <laughs> 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 uh, am I like buying something on Facebook? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I don't, well, I don't why do why you're at the Tesla dealer. <laughs> That's the dealership. I was like, yo, y'all got any uh, kids that want to go to art school? No. Um, everybody, please post your work to Instagram, hashtag illustration isolation. Uh, we are going to move there fast. So, like, post it now, immediately. Uh, yeah. And I'm just joking. I don't give out scholarships for Facebook Marketplace <laughs> trades. <laughs> no. Um, but uh, yeah. I think trading's awesome though. I think more people should be open to it. Oh yeah, there's this artist um, here in Richmond. I don't know if you guys remember that old Navy commercial of the guy using the clothes to make like three faces and it's all from donated clothes. Oh, wow. 
it was like the biggest commercial for Old Navy last year, or one of the top commercials of the year in general. But um, he's he's a Richmonder, and he contacted me because he wanted to surprise his wife with a portrait of his of their cat in like period piece clothes. And so uh, we we ended up making it a trade, and he was so generous. He gave me like a bigger piece than what I painted for him, and his work is worth so much more. So. And he yeah. just won like this huge art prize and he was really generous. It's so exciting. I have one of his pieces in my, in my house now. That's such a good thing. I think having, you know, I love being able to talk to somebody because you get something to hang up that you get to look at and keep. Yeah, it's like, you know, I love having other artists' art in my house. I, I cherish it. Yeah. I never feel comfortable. I, I don't think I'm comfortable asking anybody if they want to trade for something. But if there's something that someone wants and they're an artist, then, you know, I'd almost, well, I'd probably prefer to trade for it than the money because the, the money doesn't last, but the artwork is there, you know. Unless it's like sand art. Or edible art. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yeah, but then it's looking to eat it, you know, so. <laughs> Set that fan in the wrong spot of the room. And <laughs> We're like the killjoys here, Timmy. What about the, boy, the guy who ate the banana? Yeah. <laughs> the one taped to the wall. Oh, my gosh. I left the sand art out. <laughs> yeah. I have cats. Sand art would not last in my house. No, they would just think, oh, new sandbox. Tell me when, Timmy. I think we should go. Okay. I'll I'll hit refresh one last time. So yeah, here we go. Sandra, you turned out so well. I will say this: a few people have said really nice things. A few people have said really nice things in the Q and A. Thank you so much. That's really nice of you to say that you're enjoying this. It's so much nicer than hearing "I wish Cassandra was here" or something. <laughs> 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 One time she doesn't show up. Yeah, the one time. <laughs> She's gone one night. And Honored. Like, Why is it just Bill? We're very sensitive. Cassandra, you know what that I I was out on a photo shoot for like a week out in Telluride, and we had just had our well, I guess our daughter was about I don't know, two years old. I was so excited that my wife uh, uh, to go out and shoot at the at the height of the seasons of when the leaves are turning and uh -huh. I just said you've got to be back by Monday morning before I go to work. That's all the only restrictions she gave me. I was gone for the week. I race. I have to drive all night because I waited till the last minute to leave. It's a fourteen hour drive, and I get there and the first first thing I do is I run in to see my daughter, and I haven't seen her in a week. And I I, I pick her up and. She smiles, and the first thing she says to me is, where's mommy? Oh. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's, what, it, that's, what happens, that's what happens when you don't show up. Where's Cassandra? John, uh, can you refresh one more time? One more time, and that's it. Okay. I love you guys. All right. Okay, cool. They've never, we've, nobody's ever said that about anybody else. I'm honored. It's because everyone knows I love them just as much. Everyone's so fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Whoa. What a strong start. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We got a lot more tonight, by the way. So. I got to go fast, huh? Yeah, sorry. Oh, my gosh. Oh, whoa. Oh, great stuff so far. Man. Wow. Yo, turned out nice strong great, stuff great way tonight. to handle that. Ooh, oh, Nicole, cool. I like your dragon. First dragon. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, wow. Right. Ooh, that's cool. 
Ooh, some dragons here. A lot of dragon. Yeah. Cool. Well, well done. Oh yeah. wow, the likeness is great on that. Mm -hmm. That's fun. <laughs> oh, I really like that. But that looks like an album cover. <laughs> I love yeah. the red underneath too. Like you know, it's the fire. The love it. Like a metal one too. Metal album. Yeah, just yeah. just be like a like a metal band or like a maybe like a yeah seventies you know, rock <laughs> band. Yeah, like not <laughs> rock. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, Tyler. Tyler. Cool piece. Tyler. I can't believe you got all the background in too. Ooh, good drawing. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Great shapes. Really nice. Oh. Oh, wow. I love it. Great job. Wow. Sally. Holy. Holy smokes. The dragon cleaned up. Literally. This is man. Oh, oh I love that <laughs> cool. one. I love that one so much. That looks like it belongs in the New Yorker. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's really Ooh, nice. Karen. Yeah, the culture review or film review. Oh, that's some good dragons. The dragons may win tonight. Wow. Oh, that's a nice one. Mm -hmm. We gotta do another animal night soon, Jimmy. Jeff, yeah. that's fantastic. We gotta get uh nice. in here. Pardon me? We gotta get Bethini in here for uh Matheny. Uh yeah, Bryn Bethini in here for a goat night. <laughs> <gasps> Goat night, no, yes. We, we gotta get we could do a goat night with Bryn and Jenny. Have two competing goat ranchers <laughs> in, Mexi in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that they both are running goat ranches down there. Oh, that's lovely. They have goat ranches. Wow. Yeah. I think some people call them farms, but yeah. I think there's more respect if you call it a ranch, you know. <laughs> Gary, this those two pieces are fantastic. That's yeah. beautiful, Gary. Gorgeous. Oh, very nice. Wow. Should I feel bad I didn't do a dragon? Man, this is so good. Wow. That's fun. Nice atmosphere in that. Very delicately handled. That's fun, too. Mm -hmm. I love the drawing of the face, the eyes. The interpretation is terrific. Wow. Very nice. Good job. Oh, that's nice. Felicity, <laughs> awesome dragon. That's really good. I like oh. the flame. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. While John's finding his place, um, I just yeah, want to remind everybody that uh, early bird enrollment, uh, it's open just for one more week. So $100 off. Killer lineup of instructors. Don't miss out on it. Don't don't wait. Save a hundred dollars. Oh, Ooh, no. good job. Really nice. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Very fun. I love it. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow, Felicity. That's great. I'm going to get Felicity under contract here pretty soon. I'm, I'm going to like surprise gonna be, you. I'm going to be her ag agent and just like, before she before she goes into the industry, have, have it all under <laughs> wraps. Ooh, good drawing, Rebecca. Get some Felicity NFTs. Yeah, nice. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Ooh, wow. it's really cool. Is it all ink? Was that some of that charcoal in ink or really nice? That's nice too. Yeah. Interesting. So is that? Oh yeah. Wow. House of Dragons is bringing out some awesome work tonight. Really? Oh, I love that. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, and I love the neckline. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's like no, it's number twelve for him or something. Doug, yeah. Doug, Doug. It's been a while. Whoa. Gorgeous. So good, Doug. Oh, we banned you. You can't be in here. <laughs> Too good. We were gonna give him and Gary the handicap. You know, you only get five minutes. Yeah. Look at that. That's a gorgeous piece, Doug. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, that's nice too. It's mm -hmm. nice too. Wow, that's fun. Oh, brow toe. So good. Cool. Oh, that's cool. The shapes. Love it. Very oh, well. awesome. Nice. Good, nice, Sally. Bro. That's great. Wow, that is nice. Here we go, Nicole. Mm -hmm. A lot of good ones in here tonight. Mm. These are all nice. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. Nicole. Yeah, that has like a medieval art quality. Oh yeah, that was awesome. That was from earlier today. That's from this morning. Yeah, it was an amazing piece. Oh wow. <laughs> yes, I, I'm so, I love that AJ did that. <laughs> well, we're done. Wow. Um, nice we're you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, that was awesome. That was really great. Very uh, fun night. Thank you, everybody. Great theme. Um, Thank you, guys. Good Thank questions you. and uh, fun conversation. Uh, Cassandra, Bill, thank you for joining us. Timmy, another great night. And we'll see you all next week. Have a yeah. great week. John, animals next week? You want to do animals next week? I don't know. We'll have to we'll figure think it about out. It. Okay, animals. we'll figure it out. <laughs>